Georgia and Russia have shared a conflicting history for decades. To understand the, uh, the anger of Georgian people on that day, uh, you must know that more than 20% of Georgia is occupied by Russia currently. They took our independence, they uh, brought Soviet Union to us, they uh, occupied and yes. they annexed uh, our territories for more than 300 years. So. One of the great sins in my field is being Moscow-centric, only thinking about Russia. Now Russia is an extraordinary country in and of its own right. We need to get out of that mindset of thinking about all of these other countries, the over 50 formerly Soviet states, including Georgia, and thinking of these places as not newly independent states, not formerly Soviet states, but states in their own right. Recent protests and political situation in the country reopened wounds of the past and debate about occupation. So what's the situation there? Is Georgia stuck in a frozen conflict? This is Mako. She was 18 when she got shot in the eye by a rubber bullet in front of the Parliament of Georgia on June 20th, 2019. Mako was one of the 240 people injured during the protest in Georgia's capital. The demonstration started after Russian Communist Party member Sergei Gavrilov chaired the session of parliament in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, independence movement started to arise in some area of the Caucasus. The region of Abkhazia and Safosytia in Georgia expressed their will for independence a year later. Language, cultural disparities in ethnicity and need for national identity were some of the reasons why this region wanted out of Georgia. This resulted into violent conflict. The first phase started in August 1992, which lasted for 13 months, and the second one for five days in August 2008. Georgia fought its breakaway regions to keep its territories, but Russia, its close neighbor, supported Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Since then, most of the population haven't been granted access back to their regions, leaving tens of thousands of refugees uprooted and traumatized. Russia offered citizenship to South Ossetians and Abkhazians, as well as military and financial support. But the central government of Georgia and the international community considers that the republics are under military occupation by Russia and that 20% of its territory is occupied. June's speech was publicized as an attempt to bring the countries together through the shared values of Orthodox religion. But for many Georgians, this was seen as a provocation from the Russian side and a lack of consideration from the Georgian government. Mako wasn't demonstrating on that day. She was joining her sisters who were at the protest after work. A few minutes later, the young woman who was standing in the crowd received a rubber bullet in the left eye. Mako's reaction became viral and her face too. When she woke up the next morning, 
she had become one of the symbols of the protest. Her face was printed out on hoodies and flyers, and people found strength and courage to denounce what was seen as the government's fault through the eye of a 19-year-old. <laughs> Dem Snixi is the head of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Chatham House in London. He has been watching Russia's relationship with the world in recent years. The government made a mistake. They invited uh, a Russian to come and speak in the Georgian parliament, sit on the speaker's chair, which was, to say the least, insensitive to the feelings of most Georgians who regard Russia as either the occupier or an enemy state. As a symbol, and since last June, protesters started to gather outside Pilisi parliament every night at 8 p.m. Nodar is part of the activist and opposition group Russia is an Occupier. The movement unites young people who hold protest rallies against occupation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. On the 20th of June uh, 2019, uh, I woke up and saw a picture of uh, a Russian parliament member sitting in the chairman of our parliament. And I was disgusted, I was shamed. It was the most crazy day in my entire life. For 21 years, I've never experienced this kind of shame. Nodar was 10 years old during the 2008 war. He says that the protests in June echoed what happened in the country in the past 30 years. Also, uh, my, my parents, my family, they are refugees from Abkhazia back in the 90s. So this kind of mentality of uh, anti-Russian politics and anti-Putin politics, uh, it has always been with me. And that's why when we started organizing this protest, we, we knew that it, it was very important to clarify one thing with our government, is that we will never tolerate uh, Georgian politics going towards Russia. On the Kremlin side, very few comments were given about the conflict. In 2009, then Prime Minister Vladimir Putin publicly established his way of approaching the situation. It's clear to me that the most important thing to avoid such tragedies in the future is that the people who make decisions must consider the opinion of people who live on the territory. Any geopolitical issue cannot be dealt with without people's will. That's what the current Georgian administration has forgotten. To maintain its territorial integrity after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia had to treat the people of South Ossetia and Abkhazia with respect. What did they do? Exactly the opposite. There's been military pressure, fewer rights, and in the end, aggression, a crime which resulted in huge losses. So we had only one choice, to protect the people and recognize their independence. After we did it, the situation in the Caucasus stabilized. What was originally a war for independence became the place of targeted terrorizing of the civilian population, forcing the other party's ethnic group out of areas of strategic importance. Well aware that the situation was unstable at the border, the Georgian government tried to take action. The Georgian government has put in a plan for the reintegration of the territories and the support of the breakaway territories. Um, those plans are not necessarily accepted in full, or even in part, by the Abkhaz and the South Ossetians, so there's a lot more work to be done. But at least there's not sort of, there's not fighting, and things are relatively calm, if deeply unsatisfactory. It's true. I mean, 20% of Georgia is no longer there, whether you regard it as annexed or occupied. Um, the fact of the matter is that according to international law, at least, then that is a, a, a crime under international law. On both sides, 
Tens of thousands of people have had to suffer from the consequences of the war. Many of them had to flee their homes and relocate in other parts of the country. Not officially recognized as refugees, they are known as internally displaced people, or IDPs. When trying to cross the border to Abkhazia, it appeared that as a result of the demonstrations, there were vast limitations, particularly for men and tourists. The small village of Shamgona used to be a strategic place during the conflict. Guliada Arkania is 65 and used to live in Abkhazia prior to the war in 1992. Her former house is located one kilometer away from where she currently lives. For the first time in 27 years, she agreed to come back to the border. And even though Goliada was uprooted 27 years ago, the memory left by the conflict stopped her from going back to the place she calls home. Kuliada is among those refugees who received help from the Georgian government. It supported her financially and helped her and her family build a new home. A peace deal was brokered by Monsieur Sarkozy um, in 2008. It was a five-point plan. The Russians filled precisely zero points of that five-point plan, unfortunately, which mean, means we have a status quo um, of a conflict, not really a frozen conflict. These two countries are still in conflict with each other officially, um, and it means we have, at the very least, a state of, of high tension and appalling relations where there's quite a lot of anti-Russian sentiment on the Georgian side and anti-Georgian sentiment on the Russian side, particularly on the, on the Kremlin side, shall we say. In 2008, former French president and EU representative Nicolas Sarkozy convinced Russian President Medvedev to agree to a complete withdrawal of troops from Georgia. Medvedev recognized the EU's role as guarantor of peace in the country, but Abkhazia and Safosytia remained under Russia's control. The peace treaty actually listed principles aimed at resolving the conflict. Among them, the absolute cessation of all hostilities and a free access to humanitarian assistance. Since then, the European monitoring team known as EUMM has been patrolling and sending reports to Brussels about anything which happens in the region. Most of the time, they drive along the 70-kilometer border, officially known as the administrative boundary line. One of the key roles of this agreement is also to avoid conflict at the border. Operation posts like this over there, cameras, almost, according to the local people and our information, almost everywhere. Also, they are patrolling by foot, by vehicles. I have been witness uh, several times for, of a crossing of yeah. the ABO. Uh, about detention, I haven't. But in the confusion left after the treaty was agreed, 
signs of what could be seen as a frozen conflict emerged. The local population, deprived of freedom of movement, has to find solutions to connect with their family and friends on the other side. You can see them just jumping over the fence or cutting the fence, making a hole. And uh, just the river is not very deep. So they are just crossing the river and uh, they have spare coats in bags. After crossing, changing the coats. And uh, for crossing, usually they use, uh, let's say, friends from both sides who are giving them uh, information all the time by phone. Are the patrol somewhere close or not? Personally, I have seen to chase them, to run after them. But what has happened after, I have no idea. For this family living a few kilometers away, the border represents the worst turning point of their lives. Nino lives in this house with her mother-in-law, Julieta, and her two children. The family was from Abkhazia, but had to resettle on the Georgian territory after the first war. Nino moved to this house in 2016, when her husband, Giga, was shot dead after a fight at a checkpoint by Abkhaz border guards in May 2016. The checkpoint is the only legal way to enter into the breakaway territory of Abkhazia. Giga was visiting family members living on the other side to bring food for the funeral of his late aunt. <laughs> Among all of these memories, a picture of Giga's last text to his wife stands out. The reason of his death was widely debated and sparked outrage on both sides for months. On the Georgian side, the Abkhazian guards were accused of abuse and humiliation leading to his death. But the Abkhazians blamed Giga and his behavior towards the guards. His mother, Julieta, painfully remembers. To this day, the identified killer of Giga hasn't been imprisoned by any government. Georgia filed a case at the Court of Human Rights, which confirmed the responsibility of the Russian and Abkhazian authorities on human rights violation. The government handed Giga's family a house and rewarded his action with one of the highest honorific titles of the country. <laughs> In other part of Georgia, the conflict seems like it has almost just ended. The city of Stratubo was especially popular during the Soviet era for its spa resort. 
after the war, the city was known as the city of IDPs, for becoming one of the main refuges for internally displaced people. What's particularly striking with the city of Straltubo is that most of the war refugees live in buildings like this one, what used to be a luxurious spa hotel. Zaira was born and lived in Abkhazia until the war. Since then, she has been living in the vestiges of the past. To this day, the government is still trying to relocate and find housing for its IDPs. Why? My problem is that the gas is not working. Zaira has been promised a new house every year since 2012, but she still retains some hope of going back to Abkhazia one day. In the upcoming months, Georgia will have to get ready for its parliamentary elections in November. And despite new challenges and a recent conflict, Georgia is an emerging country with lots of richness and beauty. Clearly, right now, they're not really fighting, they're not shooting at each other. But I think it's a little bit too convenient to say that these conflicts are frozen. It's also convenient for policymakers, because it means they don't have to deal with it. If, oh, it's frozen, so don't worry about it. It's frozen. I was protesting the machine occupation. I was protesting the 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 protest. I was protesting the but at the moment, Georgia does, quite frankly, have a democratic deficit. It is quite clear that the president is not in charge, and that's not good enough if you want to claim that you're a fully-fledged European country with Western norms and values. So Georgia's got a lot of work to do, and then I think it's got a much stronger case to coming into the Western clubs, and then I think Russia uh, will have more of a problem, but then you, that's down the line and then Russia will change over time. It's going to need a sort of a systemic change in Russia for there to be progress in Georgia in a way. In this ongoing battle for national identity, generations came together as they remembered the recent conflict in the country. 
while each person has different hopes for their future, it is clear that they all share the same goal for their country, to be seen again.